Ben Khalifa, thank you for joining me. You are a visiting scholar at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Open Documentary Lab, and you're also um, here for the Tribeca Film Festival. Your project, The Enemy, is part of the Storyscapes exhibition in official competition here as a, the new media category. And tell us more about The Enemy, which is a fully immersive experience using virtual reality to tell your story. The Enemy is, uh, is I mean, when I, when I started being a photojournalist, um, I was going to war and I've been looking for explanation as why war happens and it took a very long time for me to go full circle mm -hmm. and the enemy is probably the end of that circle in a way that um, I've seen a lot of things at wars that are despite powerful and really tough but I've also seen humanity and, um, and this is what I'm trying to do with the enemy is bring back humanity in between people who have denied humanity of each other, which are enemies of each other, so from soldiers, fighters, and, and see what happens um, when we put them um, in, in a room and where we, we put the audience in the middle and basically put them in my shoes and listening to the same set of answers and questions from one side and the other, being able to navigate a space and, um, and hopefully having a sense of presence of those fighters in the room. And what is it that drew you to VR uh, from photojournalism to VR? The sense of presence and the capability to create empathy. Is it the creative use of that technology? Is it the combination of science and storytelling? What are your motivations in exploring how to build empathy and create impact? Well, when I discovered virtual reality back in the um, end of September 2013 uh, at the MIT Media Lab, um, I was immediately thinking, what if the photograph that I have on the wall, portrait of fighters, um, would actually be people in the room? What if their body language? What if they look at you? What if they breathe? What if they, what if they have all these human elements that you cannot bring in photographs? I mean, photographs can be compelling, can be profound, can be aesthetically powerful also. And, and I think the aesthetic brings you to your curiosity and to, and to think about the meaning of the photograph. But virtual reality is such a medium um, to explore today that can bring so much more information. And not information, classical information like you bring in journalism, but cognitive information. I'm not addressing in my works the power, the history, the, you know, but I'm addressing that human beings have denied the humanity of the other, and, and for a good reason. They need to do that in order to uh, to kill. You cannot kill someone you've humanized. You need to kill someone you've dehumanized. Um, someone that has become a threat, someone that is unpredictable, and someone that uh, that ultimately can be a danger for you, your beliefs, your, your land, your values. Um, and, and that's what is coming. The enemy today is a prototype. But I want to I wanna, I wanna explore and try to see if there is a way to prove my point that the same dynamic happens in Congo, in El Salvador, um, in Afghanistan, in all those places. Uh, human beings have cultures and are very different from each other. Uh, but there is something common in all those cultures, it's the storytelling. Uh, and all the cultures works with storytelling, the history, the way they relate to each other, um, the context are, around themselves, um, the social norms. All of this is, 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 is around uh, storytelling and, and I'm a storyteller. And if stories can dehumanize, good stories rehumanize. Can the enemy be an experience that is transformative? Um, and if so, how and why? I mean, it's just not being transformative. That's to understand why and how. And I think we're getting at a point today where science and technologies and storytelling can can start addressing those questions and, and, and the cross-pollination can, can spark something different, a new understanding of um, how media influence people, how media can, uh, can bring in information but also shape uh, cultural value.
the way that I look at the world, the way that I look at the universe, I should say, is a series of concentric circles. Starting with the smallest circle, the circle of self, the next closest circle, which is a circle of family, the next closest circle, friends and community, the next closest circle, maybe eventually town, village, city, country. Within each circle, you have a set of stories that are being told. They're being told because it's a way of processing reality. It's a way of processing human experience. And sometimes what happens is that, for me at least, speaking personally, the, the stories that I tell in order to deal with my, my when, when I have, let's say I have a painful experience in, in some kind of rupture, leaving a country, moving to another country, some kind of painful experience in a relationship, some kind of painful experience in a friendship, the story I tell myself sometimes can have the role of simply having me relive the trauma over and over and over. Mm -hmm. Where I'm feeding what's going on, I'm feeding the trauma. And so in that instance, what's interesting for me then, the question that I ask myself is, it's not that I should tell different stories or happier stories or more positive stories, but can I tell these same stories in a way that's different? The basic setup that we often use to be another is this. A user is brought into a space and they put on a head-mounted display and headphones. We have a performer who's wearing a camera. So basically the camera functions as the user's eyes. The reason why the brain believes that it's in the body that it's in has a lot to do with uh, visual and tactile input. Mm -hmm. If there is synchrony in the movement, it becomes a much more immersive and believable experience. So the user and the performer basically move their bodies at the same time. Sometimes the user will play around with their body, they'll, they'll, they'll look at their new body, they'll look at their hands, you know, they'll play around with them. Once we feel that they're comfortable enough, then we begin to introduce a narrative. When you're submerged in the machine and um, you're in the synchronization with a human being, it's a very intense moment to realize these emotions are not just your own, but belong to the other person as well. The emotional connectivity that is beyond empathy. And I think empathy really just shortchanges it. It is really a bonding, a creative, a, a vortex of space, a nexus between those two people. And that's what I've found. And it was, and it rippled throughout the space. So once it just, be, it, it was like a star being born. You just grab all this energy and you bring it in and then it just comes out. And you feel it. The holy grail for me is, you know, measurable shifts in behavior. That's the holy grail for me. If we can show that by doing these kinds of body swaps, by, by creating these kinds of experiences for people, we can potentially create measurable shifts in behavior, then we can make a case for, to significantly expand this kind of work. I think our work, even though we're using VR tech and stuff like that, it's in a way very critical of what this means or our relationship to technology, the way it's mostly played out, and that we're used to now everything being mediated. You know, you have you can't organize anything if it's not through your devices. You know, you go to a concert and people are recording it and experiencing it through their mobile phone because it's, you know, they're and they're watching it. Even though they're there, they're watching it through this little tiny screen and it's because they're so used to experiencing reality through this interface that you're even there and you still can't escape from that, you know? And it's one of the important aspects about the work, I think, is that you're there with the person. At one point, after having this whole experience, the devices are taken off and put to one side and you can build on that shift in the relationship that you have in real life, in real reality, you know, and I think that's really what's key about it. It's not looking for something that's going to work on empathy, that we need technology to mediate and to facilitate empathy always, but that we can just get to a point where we don't need that work. This is just like one step in a process. Distant glow.